Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our workshop today. We're talking about digital skills as it is the European Year of Digital Skills. Uh, thank you all so much for being here, and a warm welcome to those of you joining online as well. A little bit of housekeeping first. We have English, French, and German interpretation, as well as sign language for those joining online. For those in the room, if you have taken a headset, remember to return it at the end of the event. We're going to be using Slido for questions. That includes everyone in the room, so it's very egalitarian. You can use your smartphone, you can go to slido.com or sli.do, and you can put in the hashtag that we're using for the event, which is EESRF, which is the, uh, the same hashtag that's being used online on the socials. But for this particular session, you want to put 2023CI, because we're in the cinema room, so make sure you select the correct uh, workshop, which is the Year of Skills workshop for your questions, and we'll try and get through as many of those as we can in the next hour and a half. Um, we also want to let those know online that you can use the chat for technical questions and to interact with each other, but please make sure to use the Q&A and the Slido function for the actual questions to our great speakers. So, my name is Jennifer Baker. I'm a policy journalist based here in Brussels. I have a long list of questions from my speakers, but first let's set the scene a little bit. Skills are the wealth of Europe. They are absolutely essential for sustainable growth, quality jobs, and European competitiveness. And of course, those two big green and digital transitions that we hear so much about in Brussels, but they require people with the know-how to actually get them done on the ground. A recent Eurobarometer survey found that 75%, three quarters of small and medium sized enterprises, find it difficult to recruit people with the right skills. That's a huge number. And specifically, nearly half of all adults and every third person who works in Europe lacks basic digital skills. And 70% of businesses see this as a problem. That's no surprise. Europe also faces a shortage of digital experts who can develop those cutting edge technologies that we see forging ahead to the future. We want to see e-services, but they require a workforce with relevant skills. And currently, there are around 9.4 million ICT experts employed in the EU. That's a, a figure from 2022. But we need even more to strengthen Europe's resilience and to remain competitive. And it's also important to attract more women in this sector because it's a little bit unbalanced currently. To overcome these obstacles, the EU has set the ambitious targets for 2030. I'm sure we're all a little bit tired of hearing about the targets. We're going to talk, I hope, on this panel about how to actually achieve those targets. But those targets are 80% of Europeans with at least basic digital skills by 2030 and 20 million ICT specialists employed with balanced representation of men and women. So to get there, the EU has put in place different initiatives. So we've policy initiatives such as the Structured Dialogue that was held in 2022, which was aimed at encouraging member states to be more ambitious in their area of digital skills. We'll hear more about that uh, from our speakers. We also have seen networks such as the Pact for Skills Network, which is there to try and encourage people to share their key learnings. It's about getting stakeholders from both the workforce and, and the training community to come together to work on digital skills. There's also the digital competence framework that many countries are using to design their programs to train digital skills. And last but by no means least, it's funding. We always hear uh, in these panels people say, what do you need? More resources, more money, please. So there are EU funds such as the Recovery and Resili Resilience Facility uh, and the European Social Funds Plus that are there to help countries get to where they want to get. So we're going to talk about a lot of that, um, but I hope that's set the background. I'm going to introduce you now to our speakers. We have over on the far side, we have John McKeown, who is Head of Digital Skills at the Irish Department for Further and Higher Education, Research, Innovation and Science. We'll hear about how Ireland is one of the leading lights. I'm not biased at all. Uh, then we have Benjamin Marteau, who is uh, from France and the Framework Director of PICS. Veronika Hubenyakova is a course coordinator, manager of the uh, Slovakian Project IT Academy. I think you're going to tell us a bit more about exactly what you do, Veronika. Um, Aga Irmea is the executive director of the Latvian IT Cluster and member of Large Scale Digital Partnership under the Pact for Skills. And last but not least, Inugo Arai Tegay Arai is LCAM Project Coordinator from Technica. Thank you all very much for being here. 
Um, John, I'm going to start with you because, as I said, Ireland, Ireland's public administration has very ambitious plans when it comes to digital skills. Ireland ranks third in the EU Digital Economy and Society Index when it comes to human capital, um, and it's one of the top performers. I've got all the figures in front of me. 70% of EU on basic digital skills compared to 54% as the EU average, and above basic digital, digital skills, 40% compared to the 26% EU average. And Ireland is also investing over 30% of those RRF funds on digital transformation, which is certainly much higher than the, the required threshold. So tell me, John, what were the policy initiatives that, uh, that got us there? Uh, what is the plan for the future? And tell us about the societal and labor market needs. I think mine is still on. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that sounds a lot better. All right, I can take it from the top if you need. Uh, <laughs> so, where was I? So, the, the system in broad strokes is, is, is set up as it would be in a lot of your countries uh, into higher and further education. Um, and, and both are performing well and putting out graduates right now. But as we've been hearing over the last two days, um, w you know, we know that there's a level of disruption coming that we, we all need to plan for. And you know, in Ireland, we've come out the back of an OECD, OECD review of our skills strategy, uh, and that really emphasized that we need more agility within the higher and further education systems. Uh, and it emphasized that our lifelong learning uh, statistics in Ireland are, are just not as strong as, as other member states within the union. Uh, so what we've done to address that over the last number of years and the policy instruments that we'll be, we, we will be leaning on uh, in the medium term are really embedded in the National Training Fund. And that's a tax on employer payroll. It's a half of 1%. Um, and uh, you know, at this point, the fund itself has, has multiple billions of euros in it. Um, and we do access that. Uh, we've accessed that to the tune of about half a billion in the last five years. And what we've done with that money is set up uh, what's called the Human Capital Initiative. And that's administered through one agency, the Higher Education Authority. Uh, and it flows down through our higher education institutions. And then on the enterprise side, we've set up uh, an organization called SkillNet, and that's a workplace development agency uh, that operates a decentralized hub of networks in conjunction with industry bodies um, based on economic subsectors within the country. And these two work in tandem with each other to set up demand-led courses uh, on an ad hoc basis year on year in industries or in sectors that are seeing growth and demand for skills uh, that uh, is not yet being met. So to take AI as an example, in the last four years, through the Human Capital Initiative, um, our higher education institutions, in conjunction with SkillNet, the Workforce Development Agency, uh, have funded uh, over two dozen uh, new artificial intelligence courses at all levels throughout the education system. And at this point now, we're putting out about uh, 
600 or so graduates in AI uh, year on year. And we know from research that we've commissioned within my department that that is at the moment meeting the demand within the sector for high level AI ICT specialists. So that's kind of a, a rough overview, Jennifer, of where we are and where we hope to go. Well, you mentioned those AI skills. I mean, are there any specific aims or targets to get society as a whole ready for the artificial intelligence revolution? Yeah, so I suppose one, th one thing that I left out there is the, the fact that all of this is um, both supported by the union through the Recovery and Resilience Fund but underpinned by multiple strategies that are obviously set by, by central government. So we have a national AI strategy in Ireland that's driven out of our, our sister department, the Department of Enterprise. And then we also have a national digital strategy, Harnessing Digital, uh, as you can see uh, behind me. That's very much aligned with the targets set out in the digital decade. Um, and within that, we have uh, programs and policies available through the Further Education Institute in Ireland, SOLAS, which helps uplift citizens uh, to, to that basic threshold of digital skills that we need to get to by 2030 of 80%. Um, and then the higher education institutions uh, introduce the programs that we need through the Human Capital Initiative to, to, to hit those cohorts for the digital skills in the labour market and the higher level ICT specialists that we see. Thank you. Uh, Iga, I'm going to bounce to you next. Um, you're Executive Director of the Latvian IT Cluster. Now, I know all about clusters as I regularly moderate your clusters talks in the mornings. Um, but tell our audience a little bit more about what the clusters are and what they do, and what you do in Latvia in particular to support IT companies, particularly, again, with regard to skills. Here. Uh, I have actually two hats with me also today. Uh, the first is I am uh, managing Latvian IT cluster, which is IT community organization. And in such sense, I'm advocating uh, IT industry needs. But I have also the other hat, which is Digital Innovation Hub. And uh, as you might have heard, Digital Innovation Hubs, and particularly European Digital Innovation Hubs, are the initiative by European Commission to drive um, digital transformation within SMEs of whole Europe. And um, we are in Latvia, we are the ones who are facilitating this uh, technology adaption among SMEs and among all other industries, not only IT. So, so basically I am on, a, on two sides. I'm the first is, oh, I don't know what. Yeah, wrong, wrong slide. Uh, so, so, so basically, we are working on both directions. The first, uh, we take care that IT industry also has the right skills and are always knowledgeable about the new emerging technologies and have the right skills and um, enough employees to work at the uh, tech industries. But from the other side, we are also taking care that majority of SMEs know about the basic digital technologies they can adapt and they are like learning and having awareness of importance of digital transformation. Uh, as for uh, like uh, skills part what we are doing, so again I would like to relate to our job as Digital Innovation Hub and we are working with SMEs who are let's say, less digitally mature. And for those companies, it is important not to acquire particular skills of particular technologies, but they need to have skills that help them to implement those technologies, and we call them uh, digital transformation management skills. And this is something that we are working on, and uh, we have uh, yeah, here on the slide we have our matrix of uh, digital skills and how we understand what are the basic skills and what are advanced skills in, in such a context. And we see that advancement of digital skills uh, depends on digital decision making. 
So that means that uh, management, middle management, higher management of companies should be aware of technologies and should know how to implement the technologies within their, their domains. And have you seen from the industry side a specific interest in AI skills? Oh, certainly, yes. And um, today and yesterday there were lots of discussions of AI and also as AI as skills. And I would like to take a one step back and look at the AI as a broader concept. And uh, uh, maybe this is something that I really didn't like during those days, that uh, when we mentioned AI in one sentence, the next sentence is ChatGPT. And uh, <laughs> that's not really the case. So AI is a quite a broad scope of various technologies. And some of them are mature, some of them are just uh, in the, in the hype of expectations as this is a generative AI, or namely, we know them as a chat GPT as well. And there are some AI technologies, let's call them, that are still waiting for the rise. For example, decision intelligence that will, will be the next one after uh, generative AI. But as for the mature ones, for example, computer vision, that's a mature technology. And that's already in the market, and that's already uh, in the market and uh, being productive already. And companies are benefiting from this technology already. And this is what we see, at least also in Latvia, that, uh, for example, computer vision in uh, manufacturing companies, it's already working for, for like some time already, especially when it comes to... Quality control on production lines, computer vision is irreplaceable. So as for the other like new emerging ones, we see a, an interest, but of course, this interest is mainly from those companies who are aggressively innovative, let's, let's say so. And those are only maybe a couple percent of the whole number of companies and uh, they are experimenting and uh, this is their strategy towards market. Well, thank you, Anna. You're absolutely right. We do need to sometimes define what we're talking about when we say AI. It's, it's a bit of a circle of hype at the moment, but there's so many different iterations and, and levels of maturity when it comes to artificial intelligence or machine learning or computational development. In you go. Uh, let's hear a bit about what you're working on. So LCAMP is an Erasmus Plus funded center of vocational excellence. Um, and Technica is a center working on the applied research and innovation for vocational education and training in the Basque country. Um, tell us more about what you're doing and why vocational training is important for providing digital skills. <coughs> So, yeah, LCAMP is, uh, as you said, one of these projects of the Centers of Vocational Excellence. It's funded by the Erasmus Plus program. It's a project of about five million, four coming from the Commission and the rest of the co-funding of the, of the partners. It started in 2022 and it will finish in 2026 and it has a lot of objectives. So, the, the project is focused on advanced manufacturing. That's, that's the field in which we're working. And uh, yeah, we, we want to create an alliance and an open innovation community and an observatory of trends and a learning factory, a collaborative learning factory, we call it, and an online platform and uh, really a lot of things that I don't really have the time to explain right now, but uh, we, can, we can have a cup of coffee later if you want to hear more. And uh, we have uh, Noelia here as well. She's uh, actually creating the alliance, so you can discuss with both of us later if you want. Now, and then uh, the, other, the other part of the question, when it comes to the relevance of VET for the digital skills, it's uh, uh, when, when we think about uh, uh, manufacturing, or well, in general work and, and digitalization, it affects, uh, it affects work in, in two main ways. So one is the, let's say, the migration of some work to platforms or this debundling of tasks in platforms and so on, like Uber and you, you all know them. And then the other one is the digitalization of production itself. So uh, yeah, we, in, in Elcamp, we are concerned with the second one, with the digitalization of production. And uh, in this sense, there are two, two, two important considerations to be made. 
Uh, one is that uh, there are very few companies that operate at a completely automatized digital level, at, at least in, in manufacturing. You can find some outstanding examples, but when you go to the reality of a lot of SMEs and so on, they are digitalized, but it's like a process. It's a thing that is happening. It's, it's not that you find these uh, futuristic companies without workers and so on. It's, and then uh, the, the other one is that uh, digital technologies, they, they actually change work. So it's, it's not just a, a tool to do something like a hammer or something, but it, change, uh, it changes how you understand work and how you relate with work and how you organize work and how work is managed and so on. So it's a very complex thing when you talk about uh, digital skills. But uh, what is true is that we are seeing a, a demand for more digital skills especially in the, yeah, in the intermediary positions in companies which are the most relevant for us as, as VET. And uh, in this sense, we have a responsibility of yeah, up and reskilling and also of training the future workers who are our students. Now, uh, uh, for us, it's, it's also relevant to say that uh, when we talk about uh, digitalization, it's uh, such a complex process for a company and so on that you can't only think about digital skills. It's a, you need a holistic approach because you have digital skills that are becoming more and more important, but you still have these uh, transversal skills that companies are, are, uh, yeah, are demanding as well, and you still have the technical skills that come on. I mean, they continue being important. It's not all digital, all transversal. You still need to do, to do your work and so on. So we need a holistic approach. Yeah, and yeah, we, we are in this kind of uh, mindset. Well, you've heard me asking your previous speakers, you know I'm going to ask you, what's the focus on AI? Tell me about how that's uh, specifically dealt with. Yeah, so uh, we don't have a specific focus on AI. So what, what we are doing is we are, we are uh, selecting some, so, some jobs that are relevant for us at regional level, mostly at local level, basically jobs where our students are employed mostly in, the, yeah, in manufacturing. And uh, we are uh, doing an analysis of these jobs at task level. So it might come or not, but uh, we are not uh, putting it as, a, as an assumption that we will work with uh, artificial intelligence. We, we are waiting to see what, what the reality says. Well, we, aren't we all? <laughs> yes. um, Veronica, tell us a bit about what you're working on. Um, the IT Academy, it's ambitious, it's got EU funding in Slovakia, um, and it is a focus on digital skills, obviously. Um, but tell us a little bit more about what are the aims, what is your success story? Okay, so really this is going to be a story, <laughs> uh, because IT Academy was a project which started in 2016. Um, this project uh, was designed to be four years, but then Corona came and we were prolonged twice, so we uh, were a six long year project. And within this first period of um, four years, uh, we designed a lot of lesson plans and teaching and learning materials for teachers to teach in an inquiry way. Uh, of course, we designed some professional developments for the teachers to uh, support them uh, in this way of teaching. And we created some new university courses, uh, including topics like artificial intelligence. Uh, and all of this was about uh, changing the way how, how teachers are teaching our kids. We wanted to switch from maybe like traditional way of pouring the knowledge into creative, constructivist ways. And I think it happened, but then uh, when Corona came, uh, we started to focus more on support of teachers uh, with teaching uh, via internet and online systems, because our teachers were not very prepared uh, for the situation, and uh, we somehow helped them. And then uh, we were prolonged as a project, and uh, what happened was that uh, there was a new position recognized by official documents in Slovakia, and the position's uh, name is School Digital Coordinators. Uh, yesterday we heard from uh, that in Germany there is kind of a digital guide <laughs> in their factory, someone who can help colleagues uh, to use technology. So in Slovakia now we have a School Digital Coordinators. It's um, 
very good position. It is a pedagogue, it's not a technician, it's a teacher who helps other teacher, other teachers to use digital technologies wisely. Uh, and maybe like 700 people passed our course in this three years period. Uh, and we felt like they always need some support. And even though Slovakia is quite small country, 700 school digital coordinators is not enough for us. So uh, there is another project uh, called Digital Transformation of Education and Schools. And this project is here for, to support the school digital coordinators and uh, uh, leaders of schools and teachers. But what we learned from the IT Academy and we want to use now, and I think it's a good lesson for all of us, are four things. Uh, firstly, that digital transformation of education uh, is strongly about digital transformation of each and single school in the country. Because it's very easy to say, oh, we need to do something about education. But when it comes to the practice, you need to really change what's happening in the classrooms. And that's not so easy to do it by some rules uh, given by government. And that's why uh, we want to build a center which helps uh, schools to do this. And we feel like it's much uh, about strong support for school leaders uh, and school digital coordinators. Uh, then the second lesson is that uh, we have to work with teachers we have, not we would like to have. And our teachers are really devoted for their work. They really like their kids, but many of them don't like digital technologies. And we need to work with them because uh, it's a strong potential of them. They really like their kids. They really want to do their work good and well. But we need to take uh, their time. We need to make step by step with them. We, don't need to, we cannot change them in one one day and if we want them to develop uh, digital skills for of our students we need to give them some really practical tools how to do it and they will learn it uh, then and they will be able to do they on, on their own um, okay then we need to be really clear about uh, that our advices are true and we are transparent that's why we need to do research in classrooms not only maybe some statistics, but we really need to spend time with them. And that's why this uh, project aims to build a kind of na national center for digital transformation, which works within the universities, because we feel like the research is crucial, but not just some data and statistics, but to be in the classrooms. Uh, and the fourth lesson is that networking is the key, because we are not rich enough uh, to waste the knowledge teachers have uh, in their practice. And briefly, um, were there a lot of changes and modifications to the traditional curricula um, or the traditional teaching methodologies that had to be put in place, I'm guessing, to foster the sort of you know, problem solving, critical thinking, and all those sorts of factors that we need to bring to tackling AI? Yes, exactly. There need to be a lot of change, changes from this traditional uh, curricula where we trained people to do one work for their whole life, uh, for this very flexible work. And uh, firstly, I thought I will talk about soft skills here and everything, but yesterday everybody talked about soft skills. And I realized that a uh, key word yesterday, or key sentence, was that uh, we have to make our own choices. It's AI is not good or bad, we have to make our own choices. And I think that new methodologies and pedagogy should be built in that way that we learn students make good choices. Uh, and it means to take responsibility also for the consequences of their choices, to make them understand that my choice will influence not only me, by uh, also other members of the team or the classroom of the schools to train them or to show them that they are able to change uh, what's going on around. So uh, I think that's uh, the key and also to make the vision of their own lives because uh, yesterday I felt like, oh, what you will tell us we will do when there will be AI everywhere. But <laughs> we should be really clear that it's my work to know what I will do with my own life. So I think that's uh, something what is the biggest challenge now. 
big but Im and important, I think. It's a very, very clear story you're telling. Uh, Benjamin, uh, coming to you, let's talk about PICS. It's a, a French certification scheme, I guess, to prove that you have the skills that, uh, that we want to teach. Um, can you explain a bit more about it, about what you're working on, and how that intersects with the EU level, because I know you work with the EU on, on different things. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, the PICS project, it started from uh, an analysis, and I hear that a lot this morning, that digital skills are everywhere. When you are at school, when you are at work, uh, even after work with your family, you need a lot of digital skills. Um, and those skills are evolving very fast. We've got a framework, we've got the European framework and the DigiComp, but when you are at a, uh, a very sharp level, it's evolving. On AI, for instance, uh, as the commissioner told us before, it's not a new thing, okay, but it's evolving, you've got new technology, you've got new solution, and you have to keep your skills uh, uh, refreshed. Uh, and that's very important. If you don't do that, you have a risk of exclusion. Uh, the mission we've got uh, from the French government is to leave no one behind on digital skills. That's a big issue. That's not that easy. Eh? <laughs> it's the same in Ireland as you, as, you, as you told before. It's not the skills to be developer or to be designer. It's the skills you need um, in your work, in your everyday life, with your family, and so on. But it can be quite demanding. Uh, when you are talking, uh, we are all professionals. Uh, when you are working uh, in your job uh, every day, you've got issues with GDPR. It's a two-day uh, two skill, everyday life skills today in, when you're working in European Commission, for instance, but uh, it's not that easy to know and to, to be aware of uh, the rules you have to respect, for instance. That's a digital skill. Uh, so we develop an online, an online platform that is open source. I will tell you why after, because it was, uh, uh, we've got an idea behind, uh, with three uh, services. The first one is to assess, because the first step, if you want to train, if you want to teach, is to know where you are for yourself, or if you are a teacher, if you are a trainer, you need to know where are the people. And it's very difficult on digital skills, because it's evolving, and because it's very wide, the teach comp, the framework uh, we've been, uh, uh, we use, and I will thank the European Commission for that because it was very, very important for in our story to have uh, this framework uh, and it helped us even to work between different ministries in France. Uh, and so we've got an assessment tool, the first one, and the assessment is not, if you want to uh, assess skills, uh, you cannot do it only with multiple choice questions. You need to uh, throw the people in real life. And uh, um, for instance, uh, simple, uh, an example of a challenge. Uh, who modified the uh, Irish Wikipedia page of Albert Einstein uh, in the, second, uh, the 22nd March of the, uh, 2016? Okay, you don't know, so you have to search, you have to look, uh, you have to use, you have to check in the history of Wikipedia. Maybe you don't know the history uh, page of Wikipedia, but you have to look into, to search, and you learn by doing as well. So it's the kind of challenge you can find on the platform and uh, with an adaptive test. So uh, in order, because I don't know, uh, if you are, uh, if you've, got, if you've got the skills before, and uh, uh, I don't know, in school, uh, your experience, your own experience in schools, but it was a bit uh, difficult sometimes, the exams, the assessment, it was not the best moment in our life in school, at school. Uh, when you do the exam, you see the exam, okay. So we, uh, we manage with an adaptive test to ensure that you have a success on two challenges out of three, to maintain your attention uh, uh, there and to motivate the development because we are doing assessment but that's not the, the objective of life is not to assess people the objective is to develop skills to progress and to be uh, and to have the, the possibilities to to make your choice in your own life uh, so we've got a development tool as well with tutorials and so on according to the results and then the last part uh, the certification because it's important when you're for your career or for your uh, as a student, you can have uh, the need to prove uh, that uh, you master some uh, some skills. 
just uh, some figure in France today. So we started a bit like you. Uh, six years ago, uh, seven years ago, in France today, we've got around um, 6.7 million users <coughs> per year. So it's almost 10% of the French population that is using uh, peaks per year. Uh, around a uh, million and 700,000 certificate per year. So it's very, uh, it's very big now, and it's compulsory in schools, in secondary schools. It's compulsory at the age of 15 and, and uh, 18. And we launch a program for teachers as well, because you, 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 you told me about a teacher just before. And the inevitable follow-up question, how is AI learning integrated into the model? So uh, we integrated some issues on AI, because in the, even in the Digicom framework, it has been uh, uh, renewed and uh, extended with AI issues, so we, we put some, we have some challenges on AI to help the people master those skills. That's the first part. The second part, we use AI to ad adapt the tests. Uh, that's one of the, one of the important part, and we feel, because we are working for schools, universities, but as well for, um, for companies, uh, uh, and not only French companies, and they are asking more and more about these issues. Before, five years ago, it was on data. Uh, and today, it's not data. It's AI. But there is some links between data culture and, uh, and AI. So we are, we are proposing some uh, things like that. Something that I want to, to, to raise about uh, uh, Europe, because uh, we benefit from EU funding. We used uh, the European framework, because we wanted to share uh, we are convinced that we need, in Europe, uh, between member states, to share uh, tools, uh, training tools, educative tools, um, because we are all discussing and about our projects and so on, but it costs. Uh, and when you are speaking about certification, uh, you need to... The certification is all the more strong than you share recognition, for instance. I can do the best certificate in France, or you can do in Iran, you can do in Slovakia. If it's only it has only a value in your own country, that's a problem. And uh, we are convinced that we need the EU recognition on certificate, and we are proposing a way to do that because we are proposing to share some tools in a digital common strategy for EU. Thank you. I think Nat, that that was a, a useful round to, to familiarise everyone with the different projects you're working on and the aims. I think all very much tally with each other. Um, I want to remind everyone that you can ask questions of our panellists. Do use the slider tool. I know there's none in as yet, but, but please do uh, send your questions. We're going to talk a bit now about um, stakeholders, social partners and all the different people that you need to get involved. Um, one of the objectives of the Year of Skills is to actually create the skills that are really needed on the labour market. And if you need to know what those are, so you need to talk to people, you need to get lots of people involved. Um, Benjamin, I, you were last, so I'll <laughs> go with you first in this round. Um, you probably, presumably had to get a lot of different stakeholders involved for a certification team. Can you tell us how you built trust when you're working, particularly if you're working with different countries, different stakeholders, how do you build that trust? Uh, since our, our platform is intended for uh, several audiences, it's very difficult to do that because you've, we've got pupils, students, workers, pensioners, uh, job seekers. Uh, so we use um, the platform, we manage to uh, set some feedbacks uh, system uh, for instance, for the challenge I, uh, I talked to you before about the challenge with Wikipedia page and so on, um, we've got the system to get some critics from our users. Uh, on national exam, it's quite rare to, to do that, and we, we, analyze, we do analysis on that, and uh, so we gather a lot of data about the quality of uh, the challenges and the assessment. Something, just a, a figure. Per year, we got more than 200,000 uh, tickets uh, of the people to tell us, oh, you, sh you should have to change that, it's better to do like that. There is new uh, skills on that, and so that's a way to get a lot of feedbacks from all users. It's not only stakeholders, it's about users, 
and the people that tell the other to assess and to develop and to certify. That's the, the first point. The second uh, part, um, I talked about the need to share and the, the strategy that we have to share a common tool, a pan-European tool for developing uh, digital skills. Um, we've got also to think about governance. Uh, for instance, it's not anymore a French project because we're working with Belgium as well. Uh, if some of the audience has uh, some children in the Belgian school, you will uh, see uh, pics in some, in some uh, month or year. And um, we need to find a way to share sovereignty and to, share, uh, to find a, a shared governance on uh, digital common and on uh, training digital commons. So, for instance, uh, we are getting the Belgian government in our structure. We are proposing to other member states, we have several discussions with five, six member states to jump into the adventure by joining the governments and uh, the governing body of this Russia. That, that's the way to associate, so from the bottom and from the top. I got, um, similarly, uh, talking about collaboration and, of course, the Pact for Skills is all about that. Um, from your perspective, maybe could you explain how digital large-scale partnerships can help the members, can help those partners involved? Well, the short answer is that ability to meet stakeholders, that is still very, very valuable and, and, and you can't underestimate it. I can only second Benjamin's opinion about this sharing uh, what we have done and what we are doing and how others can benefit from what is already done. It's still very, very important. And I believe we are already like tired of hearing that uh, experience sharing and learning best practices, this is already something that we have heard for decades. But it is still on and uh, we still need it, especially in those times when lots of things are changing so fast and we have no um, options to test everything by ourselves because it will take time and uh, everything is changing so fast and we need also to learn from other mistakes and also other good, other good things. So I see this really as an opportunity to move ahead faster, seeing what others have done. And if we honestly exchange also mistakes, then we can learn together, do things better. It's, it's quite an American Californian philosophy, isn't it? Fail forward, yeah. learn from your mistakes. And perhaps we don't embody that quite as much as the Americans do here in Europe. Um, Let's, Veronica, stay with the question of um, getting stakeholders and collaboration with social partners involved. The technology moves extremely fast, and we always say here in Brussels that we're playing catch-up because technology changes so quickly and, and regulation struggles to keep pace. How is it with the training programs? Do you struggle to keep pace um, with the rapid evolution of technologies? And do you struggle to keep everybody going at that same pace and, and coming along with you? Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> of course, we struggle. Uh, my first uh, prompt as an advocate of teachers, I was like, oh, let's slow down the <laughs> process. Please slow down because it's too difficult for teachers and for trainers to really um, be in the same pace. I think it's not sustainable to follow this speed uh, in the way as maybe people from industry can imagine and they would like it to be. Uh, but from my perspective, what is important uh, is to name the principles that should be taught and learned uh, during the courses, during the education, because the principles are not changing so fast. We need to know the principles that are leading uh, work with AI, and it doesn't matter if there will be new technology with AI, new surface, new chat GPT 6.8, <laughs> whatever, uh, we will know the principles and these uh, can be really guided uh, in these courses and they are not changing so fast. Uh, and also what is maybe important uh, to say that sometimes happens that uh, these um, digital tools are trying to be used in schools, but it's not 
really, uh, we are not really sure if they are helping our kids to learn better. And sometimes it's uh, only the thing of the commerce that we want to sell our products and we can believe it's good, but we are not really sure. And I think this is a big uh, issue because teachers then feel under pressure to use each and single new technology uh, within the education. And that's the problem because then they are tired, they feel like, uh, oh, we have new technology, new courses for us. And it, this is not sustainable from my perspective. So we should uh, be really sure to uh, guide somehow what we are giving to schools and uh, uh, be clear about what we want uh, schools to teach uh, our kids, uh, which principles are the key for using this dig digital technologies. I think that's really interesting because you can't just conduct an experiment almost on an entire generation. So how do we do that assessment as we go along? It's, it's an interesting and complicated challenge, which we might come back to. Um, but John, tell us a bit about collaboration and bringing different stakeholders together in Ireland. Sure. So I, th I think to pick up on Benjamin's comments, uh, you know, we have uh, initiatives that, that, that are growing from the ground up within the system in Ireland. And you know, that's based from the fact that our higher education institutions are autonomous and that's not something we'd ever want to change. Um, so there, there are initiatives out there like within, say, Ireland's largest university, University College Dublin, UCD. Uh, their professional academy has grown enormously in the last two to three years, um, providing uh, education in short, micro-credentialed blocks to learners, mostly online and, and now a little bit more on campus. And, and, and I think at this stage, that professional academy is actually training more uh, workers than the university itself is educating students. I think they're, they're going through maybe 23, 20, 24,000 um, uh, skills updates per annum. Uh, so that's happening, that's out there in the system. And, and that's obviously something that we want to encourage. So recently, what, what what our department has done is try to mainstream this through what I mentioned earlier, the, the human capital initiative um, within the university institutions in, in higher education. There's seven in Ireland, um, and then there's more broader technical universities outside of that. But the, the micro-credentials uh, project, which is in a, in a pilot phase, has been funded to the tune of about 13 million, and uh, it, it's going to allow for us uh, at scale across the seven universities to hopefully solve for this issue of accreditation and trust within the stakeholders. Um, so so that's, that's one element. And then the other pillar of it, as I mentioned earlier, is our workforce development agency, SkillNet. And really what we've done there is allowed that agency to operate in a very decentralized way where they collaborate with different industry bodies and set up discrete networks. There are 72 of them now. Um, and, and by plugging directly into enterprise, um, you're solving an awful lot of the problem uh, in terms of trust, and you're also solving the problem in terms of the, the, the skills shortages that are out there within the economy. Um, so th that's kind of the, th that's it in broad strokes, Jennifer, in the Irish uh, ecosystem. I, I obviously I knew a bit about that already, but thank you for, for bringing it to the audience here. Um, in Yigo, your project is led by a consortium of. 21 partners and 60 associated partners. Um, that's a lot. Uh, tell us practically, how do you get that international collaboration to work in practice? <laughs> it's, it's something that you manage as best you can. I don't, I, I don't have a recipe for anyone. No. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> it is a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I see we have a question, a couple of, several questions online. Um, let's take the first one. Um, it's not specifically to a particular panelist, but any of you feel free to jump in. Is Do you see a gender-based difference in attracting people to digital training professions? And if so, what are the reasons and how do we address some of the, the background behind that? Who would like to? John, you're nodding. Yeah, th there's definitely an issue in this in our country and we're, we're aware of it. Um, the latest DESI index has told us that we're actually improving, but we don't understand the reasons for that. So we need to, we need to get to the bottom of it. We've moved from 14th in the union to 9th in terms of gender balance within STEM in Ireland. 
And there, again, there, there are a huge number of really worthy initiatives happening within the system. Um, Maynooth University springs to mind and, and a program that an associate professor, Katrina O'Sullivan, is running there. Um, and some, you know, so there, there are examples of, of, of best practice out there. Um, and to take, you know, to take what, what they did in Maynooth as something that could potentially be scaled, which is what we're looking at, it, they noticed that within first year cohorts, the dropout rates in computer science in particular were much worse for female students than they were for male. So they put resources where the problem was, and they turned that around within 12 to 24 months, and they've maintained that, and they've maintained the intensity of those resources there. So that's something that can be replicated within the system. Um, and you know, we see pockets of best practice, but we're going to have to mainstream those if we're going to get anywhere close to a 50-50 split uh, on gender within STEM by 2030. Yes, I do. Um, we have uh, experience in Latvia, and this is not done by ourselves, but one of our good partners, uh, organization called Tech Girls, and they initiated uh, projects learning uh, tech specifically for girls and women. And they run several very, very successful programs called like Introduction to Tech or Easy About Technology. And they were addressing uh, very, very specifically to some very feminine professions, which is teachers, quite obviously, medical workers are also female dominant. And uh, the programs are, were called like, yes, uh, technology for teachers uh, or, or easy about technologies for medical workers. And those were very successful programs and uh, interest was uh, very huge. And, uh, and I think this approach was uh, very necessary because they, it addressed those female very specifically and very targeted. And uh, they moved on with those uh, programs about uh, introductions to technology and currently, yeah, currently also males are applying and they are of course not denying them. So answering the question, I think it's a yes and no. At, at, at some stages uh, there are differences in approaching females, but uh, later on at the end of the day, so everyone is interested in technology. Benjamin, uh, Veronica, do either of you have, have anything to add from your experience on whether achieving gender balance is easy when it comes to digital training? Well, I work with uh, school teachers and there is no gender balance because it's prevalent women position. So <laughs> also in school digital coordinators. So I, mm, that's maybe kind of a uh, difference. Um, but I think um, when we are aiming at schools, and there are no, like, are we trying to make the same opportunities for everybody? Also, I saw in the slide that uh, how we deal with people with disabilities, how we can uh, make sure they are able to get the digital skills. And I think it's, it's difficult because we don't really have exact instructions how to proceed with different disabilities. And it's a huge work. Uh, it's huge work for each single subject, like mathematics, like languages, how can we deal with this? And now we have this whole bunch of digital skills. And I don't want to say like everything's solved because these kids are at schools. We, we don't have clear answer. Uh, and uh, I think we have a lot of work to do here uh, because it's, it's just not easy. Well, you've actually preempted the next question from our audience is how do the panelists ensure that people with disabilities are fully supported to obtain digital skills and are not left behind. Um, Benjamin, do you want to tackle that? Uh, thank you for the question because it's a very important matter. Um, because when we are speaking about digital inclusion, it could be it should be uh, it should be uh, thinked uh, and uh, the digital is a chance to include uh, that. So. For instance, no, for a concrete point of view for us, it uh, requires a lot of work for our developers uh, to improve and improve and improve the platform in order to be... Uh, yesterday, <laughs> yesterday, when the, uh, part of the team was in the, with some uh, know, blind people uh, to check if new challenges, and, and uh, we've got a lot of new challenges all the time, and so mm. we are testing the challenges 
uh, in order to check if it's working or not uh, for uh, different disabilities, but the most difficult to tackle when you do a platform, it's, uh, it's with, uh, with blind uh, people. And so for us, it's a very concrete thing uh, to think. Uh, I think maybe uh, when you are um, with teacher, it's easier to do that. That's uh, the platform and so on. You, you've got advantage when you want to be massive, uh, when you want to ad adapt some, uh, sometimes with a very uh, micro, uh, uh, micro items, but uh, it's very difficult for a platform since you, you get a, a, a problem, a specific problem to adapt uh, since you should not keep the data of the disability of the people when you're platform. Yeah. because of the GDPR, and I'm very happy to of that, <laughs> because I don't want to, to have a, data, a database on that, but if you want to adapt, it's very difficult to do that. So that's a challenge, and uh, uh, today, every day we are working on that, and uh, we are happy uh, to, to try to tackle this issue. Inigo, I have a very specific question directed to you, asking, do you also train adult uh, workers in the VET centers involved in your project? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, well, I can, I can, I can speak with more property about yeah. the vet centers in the Basque Country, but they, they, they train uh, all, all types of people. They, they train adults. They train uh, unemployed people. They train workers. They train initial students. And uh, we don't make any difference between women and men. I mean, you enroll there, and you have the same rights. So. There's no difference. What we see is a, a, huge, uh, a huge gender gap in these fields, in these industrial fields. But I think that's happening everywhere, at least in Europe. And we don't have a, a solution for that. We've tried many different things, but... Uh, and we're not going to solve it in one and a half hours here on the stage either. But um, it's useful to talk about it and acknowledge where there are gaps and where there are discrepancies between uh, gender balance. Um, Another question is, how do you convince adults to go through digital skills training? Um, Aga, it's, it's a big question. I mean, you talked a little bit about how women were enticed by the, the, the framing of the training, but how do you get adults in general to pursue the lifelong learning? It takes time away from people's busy lives. I think there, there are two parts of, this, of answering this question. And the first is, do we uh, look at the issue on individual level? or do we look at it at company level? Because those are, uh, I would say, quite different things. Me, as an individual, this is my internal learning culture. Do I have it or not? And it is very important for us as society to develop this internal learning culture because this will help us in future. This is lifelo lifelong learning and uh, uh, developing new skills, not only digital skills, but uh, being able to develop as personality. And this is indeed my, my individual decision. And what I see from what is going on on society level, I see a huge interest. And I see no need to convince people because people in general are curious and they really want to learn. Where I see the biggest problem is that people are learning those things that are needed for their job. And that's a tricky one because it really happens so. And also the question if employee uh, has the same vision of learning as employer, because company owner might have a different perspective, might have different um, objectives, who should learn what, or maybe they have absolutely no idea what my employees should learn. Okay, let me bring you an example. Uh, I, as individual, think that it would be quite a fun to learn Python coding. Well, it's a digital skill, it's a like, it's a topic, it's cool, and I think it's a good idea. But I maybe work in sales and marketing, and my employer says, hey, 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 you need different types of skills. Python is cool, but you need to learn about sales automation. You need to learn about digital marketing. You need to learn how CRM systems work. And you need to learn how to put all, things, all those things together, because this is your daily job. And you need to be better at that one. 
So those things are not aligning. And I would say that another issue about, indiv about this individual level is a completion rate of online courses. And uh, this, let me tell you, is a disaster. So there are only below 10% completion rate on online courses uh, for um, like platforms like Coursera, which means that interest is huge. People are attracting to those online courses, but they're not completing them. I would say that this is a challenge. That is a startling statistic. Uh, John, uh, Benjamin first, and then John. Yeah, I mean, one, one I suppose micro uh, point that I'd make here is that we d we did run a campaign to try and encourage people to to, to upskill and reskill in the last year. To we you know we ran it to coincide with the the launch of the EU Year of Skills. We funded it and and uh, put the campaign specifically in places where we felt that adults who you know let's say midlife as opposed to middle age, um, you know, who, who maybe needed to see the message would see it. Um, we haven't gotten to a point yet where we've been able to track what the uptake has been like, but uh, you know, that, that was one approach that we did take. I, I would definitely agree with your point um, that it's, there's huge interest and demand out there from people who are already in the workforce. There's a, a certain amount of an issue in our country with transition rates. The completion rates aren't as, as low as, as they might be in other states, but it's probably more about the divide between people who are, are not interested and are not meeting the threshold for basic digital skills as opposed to those people who are already in the labor force. They, they, they do want the ability to upskill and the ability to reskill. Um, and I know we, we moved to that uh, towards the end of the conversation, Jennifer, but that's, that's where I'd see the gap. Um, the question about the adults for us is very, it's um, maybe the most difficult because uh, we have plenty of uh, pupils and students and it's quite easy because there are someone that asks them to do that. Uh, you can ask, sometimes they don't do, but uh, <laughs> it happens. Uh, but uh, for adults, it's not exactly like that. Uh, but we, we try, we have two ways, we are trying two ways, it's uh, complementary. The first one is what you say, it's your, through the organization where they are, where they work. Uh, so. We are speaking in that case, we are offering, for instance, some uh, tests or development uh, of training uh, um, as a worker in a specific field. For instance, you are a, a policeman, because we are working with uh, policemen schools in France. Uh, you are a policeman, you need specific, you've got the DigComp, but you are specifically interested in this one, this one, this one, this one, this skill, this skill. So we are gathering that in a big bag and we are proposing that, avoiding the rest at the beginning. And, and we ask, we deal with the employers to propose and to give them some time to do that. That's one way. It, it works sometimes, sometimes it's more difficult. For job seeker, it, was work, it works well in France at least because we've got, uh, with that strategy for job seekers, they have a bit more time, but not, uh, not always uh, as many as we, we can uh, think. Uh, job seeker, we've got something like 500,000 per year job seeker in France that are using. And the second part, it's talking to the people as an individual in uh, he, its life. Uh, I give an example. Our main strategy for the next year is to launch uh, Picks for Parents. Because uh, when you are speaking with association, for instance, that are working uh, to develop uh, digital inclusion, often they are using the fact that the people is parents to um, invite the people to come because uh, if I'm in my life, I've got a lot to do. I'm a parent, I don't have any uh, a lot of time. So uh, I won't, for me, uh, take the time uh, to do a training. But if it's for my children, I can do that. And so we are uh, trying to reach uh, adults for themselves through the parents' uh, through the parents' uh, pretext, uh, the parents' uh, excuse. Uh, but to do that, we add some items, specific items on digital skills for parents. I'm also interested um, in skills that exist within a workforce but are not necessarily formalized. Um, is that another way to incentivize people to say, well, you actually probably know 90% of how to do this, 
but we just need to put another layer of training on top so that you've got a skill that you can point to a certificate and say, I have this, and I can transfer this to a new job. How important is that, Aiga, in, in terms of continuing training throughout a, a life uh, or, or throughout a career? I would say that this is absolute responsibility of employer or uh, top and middle man management to follow up uh, the skills of their employees and uh, planning ahead what they can do and what they are able to do in order to um, grow the company as a whole. Mm -hmm. Um, I have another question, uh, Veronica, directed at you. You hinted at this anyway. Um, the question is, is there a point in the intensity of digital skills development where other traditional skills start getting eroded? Is there a sort of a partial trade-off in terms of the focus of training? Well, um, if I got it right, uh, I don't think that digital skills are separated from other uh, skills. You have like crit critical thinking. Is it digital skill or is it 21st century skill or is it what is it, right? So uh, I don't think we can make uh, borders. Uh, and that was maybe the point before that we need to really say uh, what are this, these principles and they will guide our choices uh, concerning curricula, concerning methodologies, because of course we cannot develop in uh, 10 years of school compulsory <laughs> like uh, 99 skills on a top high level, right? So that's, uh, that's it, but uh, concerning digital skills, we also need to choose those which are uh, maybe connected with, with maybe other frameworks and build on it because it, then that is sustainable. Of course, uh, some skills are more important at the moment. Are, are, it is possible to develop them when kids have eight years and when they are 15 years old. And then some skills are uh, much easier to develop when they are really older and uh, start to work. Benjamin, a couple of targeted quick questions for you. Uh, first one is, uh, are PICS forces, are, is PICS funded by the French government or the EU? And could you also explain about why PICS is an open source resource and why that's important for digital education? Okay, so PICS, it was uh, initiated by the French government, uh, um, an alliance between education ministry and higher education ministry. And today we are we, it's, uh, also with the labor ministry. Okay, so it started, but it was uh, it has been funded uh, twice by the European Union, um, but it's a, a part of the of the of the budget. Uh, but I thank the European Union for that, <laughs> and I think it's not the the, the question of peaks or not, but. I think it's very important for the European Union not only to support public initiative or not only to support private initiative, to support common initiative, the digital common strategy. I, I tried to explain that before, but uh, there is a third way to develop a pro project platform, and that's the open source strategy. Uh, uh, we build something, it's not perfect. Uh, it can be improved by others, uh, that's the idea. It can be taken by others. and. Uh, and uh, reused, um, it's not only for um, environment uh, reuse, the reuse is also uh, for economic matter, <laughs> uh, economic problems. So we are convinced that uh, for economic purpose, for um, sovereignty, um, and uh, for uh, the need for the citizen to know how algorithms are built, uh, how the code is, the, is done, we need to have open source educative platform. It's, there's not that much. We've got Moodle uh, uh, that is very widespread. And I think, for instance, Moodle today uh, help un uh, a lot of universities and uh, training on organization to have a good platform that is with low cost. And that's very nice for everybody. And so we, we thought, OK, we benefit from EU, from EU funding. We benefit from the French government funding. Let's share it. Uh, and 
not only to be nice, but to get feedbacks and to get a community in order that costs uh, uh, not that much for friends as well, and uh, to be better and to have a better service. Um, a good question now, I mean, not all the questions have been good, <laughs> um, but one that I'd like everyone to try and address is for governance on how to address skill shortages, to what degree can we combine bottom-up approaches, mutual learning, and top-down governance approaches? Um, John, can you tell me how do we... Sure. I mean, this is really where I was aiming to go as, as, we, as we start to close out. Um, essentially, what we're going to aim to do in Ireland over the next three to five years is to, and, and hopefully this addresses your question, so please let me know if it doesn't, but what we're aiming to do is to put in place a platform um, that will be a single national portal for education and skills development. So, you know, if you're a learner starting out, um, is that, or let's say you're exiting post-primary, you're, you're 17, 18 years old, and you know you have a, some kind of an idea of a career in mind, um, what we want to be able to provide is a, a map, a guide path for how to get there. So maybe that's higher education, maybe that's a specific undergraduate degree, or maybe it's a series of skills that you can see within the system where they can be accessed and what you need to do to get to that end point. And, and that would be true, obviously, as well, of somebody who's mid-stage career and wants to make a change or wants to, to reskill and upskill. And then the platform itself, what our aim would be, is, is to, to hopefully solve the governance slash accreditation issues within that context um, by allowing the learner to upload a micro-credential or a short course that they've done and have that verified um, either by the platform or by the, the education provider or the institution. Uh, and then the skill is there, it's demonstrable, it's verified to the prospective employer and it works from, from both sides of the coin. You're able to, to see how you build your career, how you reskill, and the employer is able to see how you've gotten there. So that's, that's our, our medium to long-term vision. And you go, um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that as well. How do we make sure there is a bottom-up approach and a top-down and, and where do they meet? Yeah. I, I think that uh, uh, we've been using the, the, the word, the concept of ecosystem in the last years, especially in vet excellence and so on. But I feel like no one is really understanding it. It's just being used as a buzzword just to talk about systems and ecosystems. But uh, uh, people tend to continue thinking in terms of uh, offer and demand. So, so that I, I am offering you skilled persons and you are hiring them and that's it. So that you have the right as employer to require all the skills you need and I, and I have the obligation of providing you with it. And that's not the right approach. I mean, it doesn't work and it won't work and it will never work. And then they will complain that we are too slow or that we are always uh, lagging behind and these kind of things. So it's, it's important to understand what, what, a, what a skill shortage is in, in terms of, I mean, being serious with it. And uh, if you need some skills to do the work, then define them properly because that's something that uh, employers sometimes do but not always do. Sometimes they they ask uh, other skills that are not really needed for the work and sometimes this, this has led to a kind of inflation of skills because they've been, they've been hiring two trained people for jobs that don't require that much training and so on. Then there are as well uh, jobs that are simply not attractive. They are bad quality jobs as well. They exist and then they complain about shortages but that's not a shortage of skilled people. That's a a bad uh, offer, a bad job that no one wants to do, that you don't want for your children, let's say. And uh, this exists as well. And, and then, uh, yeah, and then, I mean, it, it's important to understand what a, what a skill shortage and to take a, an ecosystem approach where we can work together to tackle them. And I would say that in this sense, we are lacking a, a kind of universal language to speak to each other. I, I would really like to have a skill framework, but a one skill framework that everyone can use. Uh, right now we have like uh, Digicomp and Entrecomp and Greencomp and that's too much. I mean, we need one framework because it's impossible to work with all of them. I mean, we all work with them, but then you need to start talking to each other and relate everything. And I think that we need one, one framework that we can use as a kind of uh, menu on both sides, from the side of employers and from the side of uh, uh, workers and everyone. 
And then uh, I think that the government has a very important role as a, as a regulator and a, as a way of uh, guaranteeing that everything is fair. And that's important because uh, uh, we all know that a lot of training, especially for workers, happens in, in informal settings. Let's say it's not formal training of the education system, but it's training that happens in the company. And it has to be like that. It, I mean, it's completely fine. But then the governments need to make sure that they are able to validate these types of training, that they can certify the knowledge of these professionals so that if they can move, they can some, somehow certify what they knew and what was recognized within the company, but not necessarily outside and so on. Yeah, I think that's, that's important. That's what we were talking about and indeed earlier. Um, Someone from DG Employment in the European Commission is writing to say that it's great to see these successful projects and happy that EU funds and tools have helped and asking what can we do to help more, brackets aside from funding. Directly below that is a question saying, do you think that funding schemes should be increased? Um, so let's talk a little, very briefly about that because I know we're running out of time. Um, Aga, your, your thoughts on... Resources, shall we say, not necessarily just cold hard cash, but also um, other resources. Okay, um, we also are funded by EU, so we uh, we par partially we are funded by Digital Europe, and partially we are funded by uh, resilience funds. So I I shouldn't complain about it. <laughs> Uh, of course, uh, reducing bureaucracy would always be good, and we are discussing this a lot. Uh, as for is it really necessary to increase available funding, uh, if we speak about increasing funding for specifically delivering trainings, I think I would say no. I think it's enough. At least in Latvia, it's enough. So we have huge uh, offer of various training for various levels and from various uh, verticals so it's really uh, so the offer is is very big and uh, it, it, it's a question of how to choose from all of that and especially we are we are living in a uh, age of globalization and uh, we can get a training from like literally ev everywhere in the world I think, I mean, Latvia may be a special case. Not everywhere yeah. is the same, and not every EU member state <laughs> is the same. Um, to wrap up, I'm going to ask a question to everyone, to our audience here and those joining online as well, via Slido. If we get, uh, if we get your smartphones out um, and those online use the Slido tool, we're going to ask you, where should the EU focus to support the development of digital skills? Use a, you can use a couple of uh, words to, uh, to develop this uh, word cloud, and um, I'm sure someone will say funding, but so long as everybody doesn't say funding, that would be great. Um, but also, panelists, so John, starting with you, in a few words, what would you think? Um, yes, of course, EU funding came first. <laughs> um, John, where do you think the EU should focus to increase digital skills? I suppose, you know, to step back and look at it from a national perspective, like, we see the, you know, the funding that's come through the Recovery and Resilience Fund. We also see that you know this is embedded within a long-term strategy for the union in the digital decade, and, and we've tried to align with all that. So when I think about you know what more can we do, I mean the, there's all, there's always you can always push yourself in different directions. For me, it comes down to building networks. So you know to the extent that we're all here today in a room learning from each other, and that's been fostered by again by by the Commission. Um, I I can never get enough of that. You know I I, I think that. Um, the more collaboration and the more networked we are, uh, the more productive we get. So that's my take. Benjamin, what would be your couple of words, or in a, in a nutshell, what more? I can read some. Uh, you can read some, some of them some already. Of already. No, I already uh, told that I, I think the European Commission uh, should support um, digital commons, and it's not only peaks. And there, there is an initiative. Um, uh, European initiative to create a digital commons foundation uh, and that's also strategic for uh, for the EU huh? not only for the commons that can have funding but also for the EU and for this our common sovereignty and so I, I think it's a very nice project it has the support of something like 15 member states and uh, it can be useful uh, to get into that and but uh, the, the, the previous question was about and uh, 
uh, accept funding, what can we do, what can uh, be the, the role. For instance, uh, we are trying to build a governance um, in order to allow each member state that wants to be there uh, to share a tool, to decide together how to, uh, wh what should we do in the next uh, year? Together, what, can, uh, what should we improve? What are the skills that are more important or not? The European Commission is very, very useful for us in that, uh, because if we are, that's the, the garant, uh, that's the, the institution that help the member states to work together with trusts. Uh, and that can be the, the referee and they can say, okay, okay, maybe we can find a comp uh, uh, compromise. Uh, and so the Europe, I think the European Commission has, has a big role on that, except uh, the funding, but on the, the role he has, uh, it has on the, in the European uh, institution, but for, uh, as well for projects. I actually spent the last two days at a European Commission conference on the NGI forum, the Next Generation Internet Forum, which is all about funding open source and digital commons. So there is a lot of information out there if you want to go and check it out on where the European Commission is putting its funding. Um, and it's very used to playing referee, I believe. Um, Veronica, uh, from your perspective, what's needed either from the EU or from national bodies? Um, looking at this word cloud that's developing, there's a lot of common skills, frameworks, certifications, innovative teaching, sharing success stories, incentives for workers. What do you think we need more of? Of course, I have to say something about schools, right? <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, but maybe this is context of Slovak Republic, uh, that we, in this era, we really expect teachers to uh, switch to make really big steps to do a lot of changes and actually they still have the same amount of work to be done and then we expect somehow they will work I don't and learn new things somewhere in between they let their kids sleep and they wake up so I think what we need to do to let teachers some time to to learn and to let them time to learn to it means to have more teachers and this is the funding maybe we in Slovakia would need to really give teacher's time to, to learn. More hours in the day. I don't yes. <laughs> Is anybody we'll here put that on the agenda it, of the commission, <laughs> please. <laughs> I got your thoughts on what we do. Oh, I, I can only, of course, add to this word cloud uh, only skills for businesses. So what is really needed is uh, help for businesses to design the roadmaps, how they can reskill their employees for that aligns with the business needs and the business transformation. There you go. Last word falls to you, which is a, an unenviable task, because a lot has already been said, but where would you put the focus going uh, forward? In a skill framework. Yeah. Yep. Skill or competence framework, however it is. But I think that everything should be included. Digital, technical, transversal, green if you want. But something like, I mean, if you work in a company, you need to have these skills, and then you can have different levels. It doesn't mean that you have all of them to the top level, but so some, some kind of menu that could be useful as well to, to, to write these kind of strategies as well for your workers and so on. Well, thank you all very much for your thoughts and in, thank you for everyone in responding to that word cloud. I think a lot of the uh, suggestions had a, a common theme of sharing, networking, uh, mobility programs is one that came up there. So and I think that's all about communication and, and creating a community, as it were, uh, where we can share best practices. Um, I hope we have answered as many of your questions as possible. I know there were still some that we didn't get to, but hopefully you will have a chance to speak to our panelists during the networking breaks. We're going to break for lunch now. Um, I can tell you that if you come back to this room at 2 o'clock, there will be investing in people in Ukraine. If you're over in the main room at 2 o'clock, I'm moderating a session on the European pillar of social rights and making social policies fit for the future. If you used a headset, please return it to the back of the room and uh, enjoy your lunch. And a big warm round of applause for our speakers. <laughs> <laughs>